Hello, and a very warm welcome to the online book launch of The Hidden Power of Systems Thinking, Governance in a Climate Emergency by Ray Eisen and Ed Straw, and published by Routledge. I'm Kevin Collins. I'm a senior lecturer in environment at systems at the Open University in the UK. Now, there are quite a few people who are involved in today's event, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this launch. We're now going to hear the short piece from the Vice Chancellor of the Open University as a way of officially launching the book. And then directly after that, we'll go to Ray and Ed for their comments about why this book needs to be written and why it needs to be read. Hello, as the Open University's Vice Chancellor, it's always a great pleasure for me to celebrate the university's scholarship, especially when that scholarship is saying something important in a way that we can all put into practice. In this case, the importance is nothing less than how we live and work together while safeguarding our planet. So I'm delighted to be introducing this launch of Ray Eisen and Ed Straw's book, The Hidden Power of Systems Thinking, Governments in a Climate Emergency. Of course, there's another emergency right now that's preoccupying us. Coronavirus is a reminder of how systems can fail. Investments in important capabilities not made, so governments have scrambled to catch up with the outbreak, and some better than others. As Bill Gates commented on the news recently, governments organise for wars, but not for pandemics, despite the greater risk. What Ray and Ed have done with this book is write a powerful critique of governance failure, and set out why and how we need a different approach that starts with thinking differently, reframing our focus onto systems and systems with purposes. As they point out, this is not new, and there are examples in various policy fields of the approach being applied, much of which we know about because of the work of Ray and Ed's group at the OU. But what this book does, in a way that is new and accessible, is explain the how as well as the why. What it means, for example, to deframe and reframe a problem or need or design and manage for emergence, bringing forth outcomes rather than just ticking off targets. As an educator, I read their book with an interest in what it says to me about higher education and the Open University, both of course complex systems. Our purpose at the OU is to engage as many people as possible in higher education, to reframe higher education as for all, and not just a selective minority. Ray and Ed write that education is an investment by society in itself, but to draw a parallel with our current situation, it's also an inoculation, especially higher education. Higher education in particular is about not being duped, not believing what we're told without thinking critically about it, or in the words of the authors, it's about systemic inquiry. They describe systemic inquiry as about knowing through action and thinking about our thinking. As we do that in relationship with others, acting together and sharing thoughts, systemic inquiry is fundamentally social learning. The whole of society right now needs to be engaged in this kind of inquiry because no amount of scientists, carers or politicians alone will tackle this pandemic without an informed citizenry co-creating the solution. This is certainly a book for our times. It's a book that should make a difference because we share for good or ill this one planet and good won't just happen. It needs exactly the call to action that the hidden power of systems thinking makes. Welcome to our virtual book launch. We meet at a pivotal moment, a time new to human history, not so much because of the current pandemic, but because we as a species have contributed to changing the conditions of life on Earth, what some call the Anthropocene. In our book, we refer to this as the great intersection of the 21st century. My motivation for writing this book comes from initially experiences of governance failure in river systems in different parts of the world, in Australia, China, South Africa and the Middle East. This slide is of a dead, dead sea in the cradle of Abrahamic cultures. For me, it is a metaphor for our times. In 1994, I was fortunate to work in South Africa as the new post-apartheid government began. I asked South African colleagues how they would ensure the circumstances that gave rise to apartheid 
would never happen again. They replied with conviction that they would institutionalize a dialectic between civil society and the state. But as these colleagues became the state, their conviction withered, and over time we saw in South Africa the rise of state capture. From these experiences, I wanted to find a way to be able to talk about governance in systems terms. In our book, we use this figure as a heuristic device to talk about and explain current systems of governance. It has five elements or subsystems. With practice, it can be used to talk about any state. As well as the state and the law, this model adds civil society, the private sector, and of course, the media. Using this model to explore contemporary governance systems, we conclude that they are irredeemably forward, given our circumstances. Why? Well, this model no longer works. Widespread appreciation of the necessary praxis, theory-informed practical action of governing is also missing. For example, the institutions and practices that give rise to each of these governance subsystems were invented before we became forces of nature, changing whole earth dynamics, creating massive technological detritus, including in space, developing technologies of global connectivity, and allowing the rise of multinational corporations more powerful than 70% of nation states. So there is failure within the different subsystems as well as in the relations between them. Ed will talk about this relational failure using the emergence of preferential lobbying as an example. Governance in the sense we use it is grounded in the Greek roots of the word meaning to steer or I steer, as in the act of moving the tiller of a sailing boat in response to feedback from the biophysical world, i.e. through wind and current, as well as the social world, such as through rules we humans make or our sense of social purpose. Where do we want to go? In the sailing metaphor for governance, our ability to sail is also mediated by technologies, the design of the boat and the sails, as well as the designs of the rules we humans invent, or what institutional economists call institutions. Of course, who the navigators are and how their voice is heard and engaged are also critical. Drawing on the sailing metaphor as a possibility for the praxis, the doing of governing, it is possible to see three different elements or subsystems missing from almost all contemporary governance systems. These are the biosphere, the technosphere, and social purpose, and the feedback and feed-forward dynamics their inclusion would enable. Our interdependency with the biosphere, including the major cycles such as water and carbon and with other species is known, but is not central to our governance systems. Too often the biosphere is sidelined as a mere externality. The current pandemic, as tragic as it is for many, was to be expected. What should not have been expected is how nations individually and collectively failed in preparations for its possibility. It was the biosphere doing what the biosphere does, including earthquakes, tsunamis, eruptions, and the emergence of different strains and variations of pests and diseases as part of evolutionary dynamic. But this is only the downside. Think of the biosphere upside that creates the full gamut of possibilities for human wonder and well-being. The challenge we humans face is not to save the earth per se, but to maintain our human co-evolution with the earth in ways that sustain the quality of our lives, our relationship with other species and with the dynamics of the biophysical world. The thinking and practices that led us into our current malaise can't be used to negotiate the great intersection of the 21st century. And there are no preformed pathways historically determined from which to choose. We humans lay down the pathways of our own living. This is something we now need to do by abandoning what is no longer helpful and by investing in our capabilities to use systems thinking and practice to co-design, enact and inhabit new governance systems. I now hand over to my colleague, Ed. Here's the thing, uh, a fundamental we grasp when writing this book. Climate change, like a virus, doesn't listen to the morning's news programs or even read the papers. On a president's tweet or a denier's assertion, it doesn't instruct hurricanes to stand down, floods to recede, or the sun to turn down the heat. 
The planet will only respond to what we do and don't chuck at it. Hopes, beliefs and egos are extraneous. Laws, plans and targets are meaningless without effective action. The current ramshackle political systems and their battle are no match for climate change. A very significant component of that ramshackle system is preferential lobbying. As we analyze the overall governance model, uh, the diamond that Ray introduced, and the systems operating at government levels, it became clear that preferential lobbying is the most serious obstruction to effective action. Preferential lobbying is where a business or other powerful group secures its interests at the expense of the biosphere and citizens by preventing or limiting protections of the environment, the biosphere, and not paying the huge costs of pollution, and by the transfer of money and assets from citizens to big business, top management, financiers, and so on. It's wealth appropriation. It's not wealth creation. It's short-term in the extreme. It's an integral part of the prevailing neoliberal economic system. And it's a prime driver in, of inequality in all its forms between humans and the biosphere and between humans. In the US 2009 study estimated that for every dollar a company spent lobbying for targeted tax benefits, the expected return was between six dollars and twenty. In one case, the return was calculated at twenty two thousand percent. Yes, it's blatant and obscene in the US and in heavily corrupted pseudo-democracies, but it's also the norm in Brussels and the EU. The eight conditions we found that enabled preferential lobbying were all present in the Westminster UK government. Now, its exponents might rationalise that uh, preferential lobbying is inevitable in the government. It's a fact of life. It's the price we pay. But the extent and power of such lobbies is a function of the system of government. Lobbyists behave as they do because the system they operate in at least allows and usually encourages it. It's an emergent property. No one designed it in, but we have to design it out. How? Here's the slide of nine uh, things that uh, would, uh, if put into every constitution, design out uh, lobbying. I'm just going to pick on one of them. No organisation or indeed organism can function effectively or develop without feedback. Bits and pieces exist in some governments now, but it's mainly self-scoring politicians, rhetorically spun statistics, proving the policymaker right. This role has to be institutionalised for a full separation of powers with independent, comprehensive cybernetic feedback, assessing results or outcomes against purpose. Only with this can we, government, media, get away from the battle and concentrate on effective action. But constitutions need effective enactors too, just as Shakespeare needs a great cast to do justice to his meticulous scripts. So people must operate these new systems who understand the theories of systems thinking and how to apply them. Around the world, this is happening. Here at the Open University, over 40,000 mature students have now completed systems thinking courses. The OECD, we'll be hearing from soon, promotes system thinking ex extensively. No one going into any role in government or governing should come without systems thinking and practice education. Modernising constitutions and an enormous expansion in STIC as how to deal effectively with climate change and the other dire repercussions of a degraded biosphere and a bent economic system. To quote our book, what is at stake is the quality of ongoing human existence in relation to the biosphere, a relationship achieved through acts of governing. Thank you. So our first speaker is Professor John Norton from the University of Cambridge. First of all, I'd really like to congratulate Ray and Ed on the book. 
It's a strikingly ambitious work, and it manages to bridge the gap between scholarly writing and activist encouragement uh, without undermining either. That's not easy to do. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about the technosphere. To be honest, it's not a term I use myself, but I can see where it fits in the author's scheme of things. Um, their idea of the technosphere is much more extensive than anything I know much about, to be honest. It encompasses, they say, and I'm quoting now, all, all of the structures that humans have constructed to keep them alive in very large numbers now on the planet. That includes factories, farms, mines, roads, airports and shipping ports, computer systems, together with its discarded waste. In that vast canvas, um, the only fragment with which I'm really familiar are computer systems, which nowadays has to be a proxy for the digital networks which girdle the planet and increasingly both support and control human society. We have to have a name for that. Let's call it cyberspace. And it's interesting in the context of this book for me because it also, ha it also has chronic problems of governance. And it's beginning to be clear that these problems are actually having an impact on the real world of today. There was a time in the late 1970s and the 1980s when cyberspace was a parallel universe to what John Perry Barlow used to call meat space, that is to say, the physical world that we all inhabit and we're all busy despoiling. But from the arrival of the World Wide Web in the early 1990s, uh, those parallel universes began to merge. And so we got to the position we're in today, where it no longer makes any sense at all to distinguish between the online and offline worlds. And even those few small distinctions between the two that we had managed, that had managed to persist, they have now effectively been erased by the coronavirus. We're all online now, all of us. And so, and so we have, what's happened is that overlaying on top of the real world governance failures enumerated by Ray and Ed, we also have the chronic governance lacunae of cyberspace. And it's becoming clear that this is a toxic combination. When it first emerged in the 1970s and 80s, cyberspace was a totally ungoverned realm because the two founding axioms of the network, that there should be no central ownership and control, and that the network should have a permissive end-to-end -end technology, it created a space for what actually became known as permissionless innovation. So the internet that we created is effectively a global system for creating surprises. Some of those surprises were nice, the World Wide Web, Wikipedia, voice over IP, for example. There were pleasant surprises, but other surprises were less so. The trouble is that nature, as well as capitalism, abhors a vacuum. And gradually this ungoverned realm was captured and a kind of order, a kind of order imposed. This order, however, was not imposed by institutions of democratic governance, however flawed, but by a small number of tech corporations, two of which developed a business model which we now call surveillance capitalism, and which turned out to have toxic effects on democratic processes. And all the while, while this was going on, this process of imposing order on network chaos, traditional government was notable only by its absence. And one of the most interesting things that have happened in, in recent times is the way these tech giants have begun to appropriate the powers of what we normally think of as democratic institutions. There are lots of examples of this, for example, uh, the the, the so-called right to be forgotten. Um, but the, the, the one that really struck me this week was when two of these giant companies, Apple and Google, announced that they had made an agreement, a deal, that they were going to, that they were going to uh, create application programming interfaces that are called APIs um, for the two mobile operating systems in the world. That's the Apple iOS one and the Google Android one. And the purpose of these APIs was to enable governments to, to develop and install um, apps for contact tracing uh, in order to, to combat the coronavirus crisis. Now, the really interesting thing is that these companies also have laid down a condition. The condition is that governments cannot make these apps compulsory. And if they try to do so, the companies will withdraw the apps, period. Now, I'd like you to ponder the implications of this in relation to the dilemmas discussed in the book. Here we have two functional sovereigns, Apple and Google, dictating terms to what we used to think of as sovereign powers of territorial administrations.
Great, thank you very much, John. Um, we're going to go directly next to our next speaker, who's Dr. Julian Corner from CEO of Lankelly Chase. So thank you very much, and just to add my congratulations on the book, um, much needed orientation and brain food at uh, this uh, strange time we're living in, uh, incredibly timely. Lankelly Chase is a philanthropic foundation, and we have a long track record of trying to uh, get money to small NGOs supporting the most marginalized in society, people who face combinations of drug misuse, mental illness, violence, um, and homelessness. And we reached the conclusion a number of years ago that a failed governance model was at the heart of these problems continuing. Um, I could characterize it as a linear, top-down, and siloed governance model that attempts to deliver specified interventions to a specified group for a specified outcome. And the results are well known to many of us. Those with the most complex problems are excluded. Um, people are othered and labeled. It creates dependency. It focuses us on personal deficits, not on social injustice. And it has created a, a system of care, which for many is actually a system of oppression, um, with a, a number of systems that privilege their own rules uh, rather than the value of human care. So that's the, um, that's the governance model. And in trying to shift to a new model, it's all feeling very stuck and hopeless. Um, not least because our governance systems are actually starting to accelerate. We have delivery and commissioning uh, strategies which are seeking better outcomes for scarcer resources um, through greater efficiencies and more and more complicated methods of measuring and funding impacts, all measures which are actually reinforcing the, the top-down siloed linear model. Our dream is of a sustainable, um, self-regulating system with well-being, an abundance of care and justice at its heart. And our challenge is that, that this would require the deconstruction of most of the governance systems and architecture that we have in place. And added to that, we have no clear model of what would replace it other than the broad principles that I've outlined, and no idea of what institutions, roles, or resourcing it would require. In terms of what this has required of us at Lankelly Chase, we realize that it required us to transform our own governance model, to move from linear models of funding programs to a process of action inquiry. And the action inquiry model um, has allowed us to ask bigger, harder questions while taking plausible action. It's removed from us the need to know already what the solution is or to have the whole answer. And it has allowed us and the people that we work with, the people that we fund, to navigate the uncertainty, to reveal what there is to be revealed, to adapt strategies and connect new things together. In other words, it has allowed for an honesty to emerge, and indeed, it has allowed a space for emergence. Um, and it has created for us an ability to um, form a community of fellow inquirers who can come together to share dreams and uncertainties, and themselves start to form um, a self-regulating governance model. And this has taken us into investing in different things. Typically, foundations invest in organizations as the main vehicle uh, for change. We've started to invest heavily in places because that allows us to create a boundary around the system in which we're intervening. But it's also allowed us to start growing critical social learning systems in places that bring more and more perspectives together and that put learning rather than 
uh, outcomes and delivery at the heart of the work. We've shifted to investing in networks um, because that creates a fluidity outside of organizational hierarchies and allows us to bring more and more actors together to form a critical mass. And again, creating some form of self-regulating um, model. And it's allowed us, and we've shifted to funding uh, capabilities, uh, helping to create shared language, new, new methodologies and models, new space to look afresh at, at uh, the problem. So action inquiry has allowed us to model a new approach to governance while exploring what the future might look like. And in trying to look at that new model, we've had to start by transforming ourselves. Um, so the first question, it's how do the values and behaviours of the government align with individual concerns and requirements that are arising now from the current situation that we're in? Um, because not everybody has access to being online, so they've become more isolated. So that's, that's a good question. And one of the interesting things about the coronavirus is that it has highlighted the fact that there is still, uh, although four billion of the people in the world are online, there's still a significant digital divide in different societies, including Britain. Um, in this country, for example, the volunteers and others I've been talking to in my village and elsewhere, uh, they're 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 finding that um, the people who who need often need the help most and who are most vulnerable um, to the to the crisis are people who actually don't use the internet, um, and that's uh, that that's a significant um, it's a significant problem that we kind of had to, I think broadly speaking tend to forget about um, in terms of how how we would um, move towards. A, a better society. Well, that's the the, pro the question raised by the whole book. Um, and at some point, if we might get to it today, but I think that that what I felt we need to talk about most is not just where we want to get to, but how, in a political sense, we might begin to get to it. Um, Julian, uh, I mean, you talked a lot about innovation. Um, what would you need for that for you to be able to innovate even more? I mean, what, what's the, what are the big constraints that you're experiencing and, and where do you see these opportunities? The innovations that I'm describing tend to be more innovations of um, mindset and behaviour than necessarily uh, the, the social innovations that we're used to where people try and provide uh, models and solutions to, uh, to social problems. And in a sense... Um, that is an advantage in this situation because um, social innovations have proved remarkably hard to scale. Uh, they tend to sort of evaporate like morning dew on contact with uh, the reality of, of our system, current systems of governance. Um, whereas um, what we're trying to get at is something um, can we put more, email on screen? more fundamental in the way that we think and act. Um, and um, and actually, I think we can start to build um, uh, alliances at scale in a way that have been much, much harder to do when we focused on on products, on, on scaling things. Um, what it would require, though, is um, is more of an authorizing environment from government. Um, to um, start understanding um, that the, the capabilities that are needed um, uh, exist in, in the way people act rather than just in what they do, um, um, in the way that they think. And um, it's quite possible that the current crisis is going to create uh, more of an opening for that. Um, John, I mean, cyberspace is is notoriously ungoverned at the moment. Um, what institutions do you think we should be introduce, introducing in order to bring cyberspace into more governance orbit, as we might describe it? It's a big problem and, and one we are nowhere near um, grasping at the moment. Um, we have a global, a global network, although I think that will change. It will become a fragmented network of local internets. Um, which will be subjected to government control in their jurisdictions. 
Um, but at the moment, we have the problem that it is it is still global, and we have local local um, administrations. Um, there have been a few cases where some kind of some kind of order has been restored. For example, in relation to child pornography, um, there there is a good a good deal of effective cooperation um, by by state organisations, which has had um, in collaboration with the social media companies has had has had an impact. But in most of the other areas. Um, the, the technology has developed and the companies have exploited it without any kind of uh, regulation. So if, if we were going to change that, two things would have to happen. The first is that the public would have to be concerned about some of the downsides of this stuff, because in democratic states, governments rarely move unless there's some kind of citizen concern. And at the moment, that citizen's concern is not is not being expressed in any kind of effective way, and perhaps not even being felt in a, in, a, in an extensive way. And the second thing is, we need to simply overhaul the laws we've got, or think about uh, new kinds of regulations that we might need. Um, antitrust law, for example, it needs to be overhauled. Uh, it's still very powerful and could be used, but it isn't. And if you just want an example of that, I mean, for example, Facebook should never be allowed to own WhatsApp. And Google should never be allowed to own YouTube. Simple things like that we could do if we had the political will. But political will only comes from a feeling on the part of politicians that the voters are really interested in this. It strikes me, Julian, that we have a situation there where, and you know, Google and similar would be great innovations, but they're still outside um, governance. And yet you are trying to innovate. Um, do you feel that you're supported by the governance arrangements around you? We have an incredibly um, mechanistic, risk-averse set of governance arrangements in the, in the UK, um, which are not uh, based on on human value, uh, relationships, um, or values of care. They're based on uh, compliance, regulation, value for money, um, and, um, and many more mechanistic um, measures of performance. Um, and I think what we have to start doing is creating the spaces where the different kind of value that can emerge from uh, alternative governance systems can start to be demonstrated and felt. Um, I have a concern that these themselves will become marginal innovations, that um, that large long term systems will look across them at them and try to co-opt them uh, to their own ends. And so we in philanthropy, but uh, also more widely, have a obligation to start long term processes of shifting power uh, towards those who in all justice, have a right to be part of those governance processes um, and um, who, frankly, would um, enact them more effectively and more in the interests of those whom they serve. Um, but that is a long term. Um, that is a long term push because there is a lot to, to deconstruct. Um, so our first speaker in this next session section is Professor Eileen Munro at the LSC. So please, Eileen, over to you. Well, it's through experience that I have learned the value of taking a systemic approach to solving a problem. In 2010, I was asked to undertake a review of the child protection system in England by the Secretary of State for Education. And I began by framing the problem in a new way. There had been several major reviews of child protection over the preceding decades, and they had all primarily seen the problem as poor frontline work. And so most of their recommendations were about increasing control of those workers to get them to perform to a higher level. So they're bringing in more and more guidance, more and more procedures and rules, and then checking compliance by having targets and performance indicators. My reframing of the problem uh, involved taking a broader systemic look and asking whether the front line were being helped or hindered in working with families by the central and local governance and the organizational processes. I produced nine re recommendations that were mainly on change in governance. So it was about reducing the amount of rules coming out of central government 
their subsequent um, revised statutory guidance was reduced from 400 pages down to 97, um, also abolishing most of the targets around timescales and um, reducing the amount of data that had to be inputted and collected together and sent to central government. Um, and the, the change um, was also to the national inspection process that was a major driver of practice. They had been inspecting on, on how well you were doing a compliance, but they are now using a framework which is looking at evidence that you're positively helping children and families. And they are slowly changing um, the, the priorities in local government as a result. Um, so those changes gave local children's social care departments a great deal more autonomy and then the ability to find new ways of getting feedback from children and families about whether they were helping and also then the ability to adapt as they saw new problems emerging. Um, and since then there were many, the government funded a lot of innovation projects to try and use that autonomy. And I worked with one that involved working with 10 local authorities, implementing signs of safety as an organizational approach um, for everyone and so needing whole system change. We made extremely varied progress amongst those 10. Uh, using the Ofsted inspection judgments, some of them went up to being outstanding while others actually sank down to being inadequate, which um, allowed for a considerable amount of analysis of what were the factors that mattered. And a really crucial one is about the leaders understanding how to think systemically and to realize how many things that they had seen as in separate little pockets in the organization were actually having a causal impact upon what children and families were experiencing. Um, so the, the lessons that I learned from all of this is, A, changing governance is hard, and I think that the progress I made at the um, child protection issue was partly that it was blindingly obvious to everyone there was a serious problem and you needed a new way of looking at it. But it was also a brand new government after 13 years of Labour government, so they had a sense of not being able to be blamed for picking out the problems. We also had the rather unexpected benefit of being allowed time to make progress because for the last few years the government has been so absorbed with Brexit and then more recently and very tragically with the pandemic. So, um, and at the local level, what, what becomes very clear is how difficult it is for people to understand what systemic thinking in practice looks like. And I think something that makes this even more complicated is that an awful lot of people think they understand it, but what they're really doing is just sticking to their current worldview and making it a little bit more complicated. So I'm hoping that this book by Ray and Ed will actually help people make that huge conceptual leap away from the rather static worldview that they have into understanding why a systemic way of thinking is so important. So we're going to go directly to Pirit Tunarist. Um from the OECD. So good afternoon to everybody. So I hope you can hear me well. Uh, congratulations to the authors of the book, uh, of all the good work that you have been done and a small time uh, add on to the debate on system thinking and especially in the current crisis. Because I think that the, what the current crisis is indeed done and we have seen it across our member states is that, that become more apparent than ever. So at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation at the OECD, we have been working uh, on the issue of system thinking and trying to normalize that in our member countries for the last uh, four years. And uh, uh, to be quite frank, the conversation has changed quite a lot during those uh, four years. So I think we talked to three countries when we started the discussion around system thinking. And now when we are having these issues, then I think that we have all OECD countries on board are at least talking about these uh, topics. And uh, what we see our, from our work is uh, a lot of uh, kind of different learnings. Uh, but we can see from, we do specifically action-oriented research in countries, so we don't only look into the kind of the cases themselves, 
so do analysis on system change within our member countries, but also help countries in action-oriented processes to change their procurement systems, their use systems, their other education systems, uh, and try to kind of learn from practice of what is going on in government. And what we have seen in the practice itself in working in Wales, in Scotland, uh, in the UK realm, but also in Finland, in Sweden, uh, in Slovenia and elsewhere, is that there is a really big difference in knowing and knowing. So knowing uh, about the tools or methods of system thinking and the role of kind of systemic issues uh, of problems. So I think that nowadays uh, in the policy circles, you don't find a lot of people who who would say that uh, kind of the prevailing uh, policy challenges that we're facing every day are not systemic in, in some way or another. But uh, there is a little kind of really true knowing about the, the facts that these kind of uh, uh, problems are urgent, that we actually need to do something about it. So it's not only about knowing that these are prevailing wicked issues, but actually doing something about it. So knowing and doing are, are very much uh, not connected. And in many ways uh, uh, that we have seen in that at least the uh, last three years that we've been working together with governments, with highest level civil servants across our uh, member countries, is that a lot of uh, people in power are actually the most powerful. Uh, decision makers and leaders actually feel uh, the most powerless, that they don't feel that they can take on these systems or the tasks are too big or the kind of structures are too ingrained to actually change them. And I think that what is very important our narrative to develop from the current crisis is that change is possible. We see it every day. So once we have confronted with the urgency or things that need to change uh, on a daily basis, then decisions and also systemic decisions tend to happen. And that uh, it's actually possible to do so. And now the question is, do we need to always uh, be in a crisis or get to a, in a climate change form and get our feet wet before we actually start to making those kind of systemic decisions on a daily basis to actually change things. So it is possible to do that. So from our perspective as well, there needs to be an ongoing capacity of systems thinking uh, within our member governments and also in, in policymakers. And it shouldn't be seen as a one-time thing of one-time uh, think of sense making around the problem or issue. Usually the problems that you try to solve through system thinking are prevailing ones. Once you solve one issue, another issue emerges. So you actually need to adopt it as one of your core actions. And that's what we are also trying to build capacity within our member countries, not only to come as uh, using system experts in our work from outside, but also build the capacity to continuously at the prospective. And I think that the current uh, crisis that we are ongoing is highlighting those issues uh, in a, kind of a very visceral way, that uh, the inequalities, the, the risk on to sustainability, the issues with our housing system, etc., have become more visible than ever. So we have a really a window of opportunity at the moment because the policymakers and administrators are in this kind of zone of neutral zone without uh, where the ideology of what type of solutions have to be there beforehand doesn't exist. So there is a lot of room to actually reframe using system thinking and systems analysis about what the kind of solutions that we actually can and uh, can uh, come up with. And uh, I really would call using the book that you have written as well uh, to use these kind of analysis tools to uh, analyze the kind of uh, the new types of systems that uh, uh, different governments uh, in OECD countries and beyond uh, actually need. And also to probably use the systems analysis to analyze the ex uh, effects of the different solutions that have been adopted uh, throughout this crisis, because we see experiments going on every single day that have systemic effects uh, from uh, basic income experiments to uh, experiments that are infringing on our privacy and have long-term effects that we also need to analyze and evaluate them uh, in some way. And I think that system thinking can be of real value there. We've, we had a question which came in right at the end of the previous session, which was, to what extent do you see other organizations learning from your the way that you're trying to rethink these these situations. I mean, do they look to you 
do you experience being leaders in this field? Because as you mentioned, Pirette, for example, there are leaders are feeling powerless. So who are they looking to for this guidance, for this new way of thinking, for the skills and capabilities? I found that there's a great deal of interest from child protection services around the world. And the, the more junior you are in the organization, the more convinced you are of my analysis. Um, but even uh, it's about getting the national politicians um, to endorse it, as well as uh, the actual child protection agencies. And that becomes a stumbling block because uh, child protection and the risk of a child death is so it's both very, very distressing, but it's also politically very damaging. Um, so to actually let go of their sense of control and to learn to have confidence in a new way of controlling things is a very big step for them to take. So maybe commenting on who the leaders are looking towards. So I think more than ever during this crisis that the leaders are actually looking towards evidence of any sort. So at the current uh, chaotic phase, I think we're looking for solutions anywhere. Uh, but uh, before the actual crisis hit, uh, then I think that uh, I, I concur with Eileen that you will find uh, a more kind of a first uptake of system thinking at the lower levels of organizations, uh, because uh, the lower and junior levels of organizations tend to be also closer to the issues and see the kind of the systemic issues on the ground uh, much easier, or to see that, they are not, that the current system is not making a difference. So it's much easier to make the case than, uh, than at the top level, leadership level, because the risks of changing uh, on their positions is quite large. But I'm not saying that this is not possible, because uh, usually when there is a will, there's also a way. So our work, in our work, uh, when we start to work with uh, uh, some junior level people from the organization as well, is to build coalitions from the bottom up. So once you have a coalition of uh, critical stakeholders who sh uh, share and talk about an issue or the problem in the same way, using the same language, issues, then it's easier to also uh, high-level decision makers to come on board. So usually uh, what we see that uh, the high-level leaders tend to listen to the organization themselves. So the organizations and their community have to bring this uh, news to them that things have to be different. I mean, you've both mentioned about leadership and, and having um, people coming towards to you and learning from you and so on. But so there must be good examples of where systems approach has been a key factor in success. So this kind of evidence that leadership or leaders are relying upon. Can you kind of say anything more about where you've seen really good examples of where systems approach has been a key factor in success? Speaking specifically on child protection, I think the, um, the government has a research dimension to all this innovations funding it's given. And that is... Um, showing up quite well how the places making progress are making whole system change and changing the way they're getting feedback and, and what they are doing to learn whether they're succeeding or not um, and, and moving away from the old targets kind of mentality. So I think that's one one place for a narrow subject area. Um, we have been using system thinking uh, and there are also good partners in using system thinking in Finland, for example, for uh, family policies, youth policies, but also broader socioeconomic policies. Uh, I think that the climate kick uh, also in the European uh, innovation and technology kind of frame has been doing absolutely great work in framing uh, sustainability and climate change with using system thinking uh, methods and technologies. And there are a lot of actually uh, sectoral approaches that have been used and applied uh, from security systems to uh, uh, climate change to social economic change in different countries. So there are more good examples actually out there than, than we think. And hopefully we'll hear more about them uh, in more detail as well. Usually you end up talking about the outcomes, but not the process of how things are done. So more kind of attention should be also put on the process of uh, how system thinking was applied in practice. I mean, how do sort of high level leaders connect with their teams and how does sort of language and a sense of place enable you to either build new possibilities or perhaps constrain opportunities? So that sense in which 
high level leaders want to want to engage with these ideas, but the the language, do they have the language um, issues? Um, not necessarily in terms of French or German, but simply the language of systems and the the thinking and the concepts that go behind that. What we definitely see is everybody has connected to the word systems and leaders and otherwise always have something in mind when you talk about systems. So when you actually need to create the common language right off the bat, so do a little bit of sense making or problem framing uh, to begin with to actually agree upon when we're talking about the system, what is it, uh, what, what, what it actually is. So how do we analyze the system or look at the system? Uh, because otherwise you would talk about apples and oranges. Because people, you know, tend to think about the traditional systems or how they think about systems in everyday life, and uh, maybe not uh, the kind of the tools and methods that we use every every day in our kind of transformation journeys. I think leaders can live the thinking. They can always say to a frontline worker, um, "How is the child doing? What, what's the child experiencing? Um, how have the parents responded?" That, rather than what they might have been doing before about you haven't met the timescales. Um, and I think, you know, they're legitimizing the language that um, social workers at the front line would have been using anyway, but saying this is actually the, the language with which we're going to be um, leading the service. But being visible is incredibly important, it seems, you know, whether it's virtually or in person, um, but of actually showing that you're talking to families, you're talking to Workers, I mean, in some authorities now, the director will go out on home visits with uh, workers just to keep them grounded in what the work is really like and show that they really understand what the work is like. So that they don't just get hooked on the idea that beautiful computer data is good enough. I get the impression that more and more people are getting an understanding of systems thinking. It's, it's spreading much more slowly than the coronavirus, unfortunately. Um, and now I'm going to invite Ray and Ed to offer some further comments and maybe respond to some of the question, uh, questions they've heard or some of the themes being raised by the speakers. Um, so, Ed, um, would you like to take the floor for the moment? The things that strike me so forcibly at present it, uh, that you know pe people often say well you know the, the, i mean we've got 26 principles in the book uh to incorporate into how systems of government should work in the future um uh and how constitutions should be radically changed so that then all of the things that have been talked about today can can happen more consistently. Julian, you know, is not uh, working manfully to, uh, or personfully to get uh, change on the ground, uh, but then bumping up against this hideous centralised uh, government system. But we've seen with COVID-19 uh, that um, we can uh, tear up the rule book. Um, that uh, actually all of these supposedly uh, uh, institutions that are cast in stone or economic systems that we just have to operate, actually we can throw away the rule book. And now with uh, COVID-19, we've got focus on purpose. We've got abandonment of faulty thinking and practices and the institutions they've produced. Uh, we're dealing in reality. Gosh, can you imagine that? We're acting collectively and we're redeploying state and business resources. All of these things can be done. But if they're going to be done consistently, uh, rather than through the exceptions that good people uh, 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 act upon uh, in various guises, then, then we've got to change. I mean, what we call, we've got to have second order change. So we've got to change the system rather than change within the system. Um, one, one of the um, other points I wanted to make, and do um, uh, cut in if I carry on too much, but there's still the whole basis of democracies and politics and political parties is this notion of the end state fallacy. So politicians offer various policies in their manifestos, and the idea is that uh, uh, electors sort of select between this basket of things and then go, OK, we'll have that lot. 
And then the idea is that the politicians come into government, they make decisions, pass laws, and somehow a government machine pushes them into action. And this is what I call the end state fallacy. I mean, it, this notion that you can policyize an end state into existence is by and large fallacious. Most of government from every regulation through to the economic system, to a reform of a school system, to housing, is a political experiment. And we have to construct government to get away from a situation based on, if you like these offers, would you like this offer, would you like that offer? Um, I want to start by just uh, uh, acknowledging the uh, brilliant introduction that our Vice-Chancellor gave to the book and uh, his very perceptive insights into some of the key messages of the book. And I want to thank our speakers uh, particularly for illuminating a gamut of issues that um, our book addresses. And uh, while I've got the floor, I'd also like to acknowledge my co-author, Ed. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we um, had our moments when we were trying to write this book together, but um, over time our mutual respect for each other grew and has continued to deepen and we still gain great insight from working together. So I thank all of you uh, tremendously for making this uh, uh, project, uh, which is important to me and then I think important to us collectively, uh, a, uh, such a meaningful experience. Now to pick up on just a couple of points that are coming, uh, in systems uh, parlance, there's a concept called a structure-determined system, and a system can only do what it's structured to do. And Ed has alerted us to this, and the, the virus has made us break structures that were seemed immutable in the past. Where have been other times of immutability? Well, when citizens of a young Australia or in the U.S., or possibly in a South Africa, came together and formulated new constitutions, new rules of the game, and new institutions to do what they needed to do, well, then they showed that they could change fundamentally the rules of the game, the governance systems we operated in. And I must say, uh, in uh, picking up John Norton's point about the balance between scholarship and activism, uh, as I get older, I think I incline more toward activism, and I would despair if anyone viewing this uh, video or reading our book didn't incline towards activism as we exit this virus uh, uh, pandemic, because it is a great opportunity to create a set of new starting conditions and new pathway dependencies and to move into territory that we have not occupied before. There is no going back. So what do we want to do? What is the sense of social purpose we want to create collectively as we move forward and move beyond the uh, virus into the issues of uh, our relationship with the biosphere, bringing the technosphere into the ambit of social purpose, but more importantly, how we as citizens can enact our commitment and our collaborative action and inquiry into charting a direction, charting a, a course into the future, uh, which has mutual respect uh, for each other, for other species, and for the dynamics of the biosphere. So if I could uh, leave you with one, uh, um, I guess, uh, request, imperative, Please think about how you're going to operate to make things differently as we move over the next few months. It's pursuing Ray's points that, uh, it, you know, it, it, there are people in the world, uh, quite a lot, who are seeing a blue sky for the first time in their lives because pollution has been cut so much. And it's like we know we have to cut this pollution, uh, otherwise it, it, you know, the world is fairly rapidly going to accelerate. I mean, we've all seen these exponential curves. 
Well, you know, once the, the tipping point is reached, some people say in nine years' time, I don't know precisely when, obviously, but once that tipping point is reached, then, then we're into an exponential curve of disaster. Um, um, we've, we've this opportunity has been created by this virus where there we are, we've degrowthed, we've re-rated the economy, uh, we've collapsed uh, the amount of pollution. Now, at the end of this, are we going to go back to, to producing the amount of uh, uh, rubbish that we chuck into the world that we have been, or are we going to say, hang on, here's a hell of an opportunity uh, because we could transition from uh, what, what I uh, would like to coin the term pandemics uh, and, and the economics that's going on at present. Could we, could we transition from that uh, to a biosphere sensitive economy? And, and it, you know, this opportunity, uh, I hope we can grasp. And perhaps building out from that, um, the question that's come in is about... Um the book mentioning Ashby's law of requisite variety as part of systems practice. Now, from both you and Ray, have just outlined this opportunity for change. And the question is really about how do we govern complex systems based on Ashby's law of requisite variety when we know there'll never, there will never be sufficient variety to totally control complex interdependent systems. So how do we make, how do we handle this increasing complexity and these with all of these new opportunities when we will never have sufficient requisite variety. For those who are not clear about it, Ashby's law of requisite variety says that only variety can manage variety. John Norton has written very elegantly about this as well, so please do a search for his work. Um, we argue in the book that uh, one of the uh, emergent phenomena of uh, global climate change will be increasing surprise and uh, we will only be able to deal with the surprise and uh, variation that comes our way by localising uh, and decentralising and distributing and deliberatively engaging with the uh, variety and surprise that comes our way and that a command and control model of governance will no longer work. So uh, that requires an active citizenry. It requires an investment in systems thinking and practice capability. And we at the Open University have been educating systems people for 50 years now. We know how to do it. We know this is possible, but it is uh, uh, under invested in. And I hope that uh, one of the things we collectively can do can ramp up the level of investment in uh, these um, capabilities. Uh, but institutions also need to be put in place and our constitutions are part of it, which enable uh, Ashby's law of requisite variety fun to function. In a command and control model, you completely undermine Ashby's law of requisite variety. I mean, just a very uh, pursuing all sorts of uh, uh, Froom uh, in Somerset in England uh, couldn't get enough doctors and nurses. Uh, so they looked at uh, managing demands and the way they looked at managing demand uh, was to uh, get people working with the 600, I think it was, voluntary and charitable organisations there and connect to those with people with chronic conditions because they found that uh, in doing that and getting people interested in, you know, knitting or bird watching or books or woodwork or whatever it happened to be, um, that took them out of, uh, uh, well, social isolation often and uh, got them connected with the communities and actually uh, that is the biggest uh, determinant of mortality in the sense that it's more important than stopping smoking, stopping drinking, so on, so, uh, social connectedness. So actually the number of people going to the surgery reduced, but actually the number of chronic emergencies going into the hospital reduced as well, and they cut costs, they have cut costs substantially. Now all of that work came out of uh, four people acting locally 
totally ignoring all of the top-down initiatives and controls of all the rest of it that comes out of the Department of Health. Now, you have to construct, and, and that's because those people were, on the one hand, bloody-minded, uh, systemically educated or sensible, and just wanted to get on with it. And, and that's the uh, environment, uh, uh, the ambience that we have to create at a local level that people can respond uh, to these things. Uh, the interesting thing here is that actually bringing, com well, the many interesting thing, bringing compassion to the table has been the best way of doing some hardcore cost cutting. Uh, and, and in terms of a sort of systemic response, an unexpected one, I think it's one of the best. Um, thank you both for, for the uh, commentaries that you provided there. So I'm going now to invite some closing remarks from Professor Gerald Midgley at the University of Hull, and immediately after that, Nick Braithwaite, the Executive Dean at the, our STEM faculty here at Hope University. Um, I've been invited to give one of these closing remarks because I'm the editor of the book series that... Um, uh, Ray and Ed's book is published in, um, and I'm, I'm really glad to see this coming out as one of the first books in it. I was going to talk about the various imperatives that um, uh, are facing us, but on the spot here, I've decided to do something different and say why I actually feel much more optimistic about the future of systems thinking and the possibilities of change than I ever have in the 35 odd years I've been working in this in this space. Um, and I'm comparing partly to what it was like in the mid 80s when I came into this, when you couldn't have a conversation about systems without hearing the words, is that kind of some kind of computer science? And when you actually tried to explain what it was about, people didn't have any kind of cognitive frame to hang it on. So they just started looking blank. You just don't get that anymore. We, we're in a much better situation than that. We've seen uh, an evolving understanding over the years. And I think there was a watershed moment in 2017. And for me, that watershed moment was when the UN... Uh, the WHO and OECD all called at roughly the same time for the use of systems thinking to deal with highly complex problems. Um, and suddenly the interest exploded. And if you just think about um, the UK, so we have a systems unit in the cabinet office in the UK. Um, I've been doing a bit of work with those people. They do really know what they're doing. We have systems capacity in DEFRA. We've got local governments up and down the country who are recruiting systems teams and public health in particular uh, has been influenced by the use of systems thinking as part of community development. So we've got a, a situation now where a lot of public health outcomes are being viewed as emergent properties of um, volunteer led community development rather than being something that can be imposed top down through target uh, driven uh, work, just like Ed was saying earlier about that uh, example in Froome. We've got a systems thinking practitioner apprenticeships, so it's becoming a recognized career to use systems thinking. We've got 31,000 people in systems thinking network on LinkedIn, um, which is the biggest collection altogether of systems thinkers I've seen anywhere. Um, and I think Pirat earlier was right to say that there's still a big gap between knowing about it and actually doing it. But we're in a position where we can really begin to bridge that gap now, um, especially now with COVID-19, uh, showing the crying need for a systemic response. Um, so I think we're really poised for an even greater interest and uptake. And one thing I would like to say about COVID-19 before closing is I keep on having the same debate online. Half of my friends are saying this is a wonderful opportunity to change the governance structures of the world. And another half are saying we're going to go back to business as usual. But climate change is going to take off again it, and it's doom and gloom. And I keep on saying again and again that the future is not written. It's up to us to actually make that change. So one of the things that I'd like to leave 
to the systems thinkers um, listening to this today is let's do a bit of systems thinking on how to develop systems thinking for the governance systems in our society. Kevin, Ray and Ed and their systems thinking in practice group are based at the OU within the School of Engineering and Innovation of the STEM faculty and it's been good to join them today at a kind of great intersection in a local part of the technosphere celebrating a new guide to the hidden power of systems. I'd like to thank the facilitators whose work behind the scenes has made this launch possible despite being in a COVID-19 lockdown, particularly noting the coordination of the STEM comms team led by Katrina Bray and the internet artistry of Ben Hawkridge. Likewise, we're grateful to our vice chancellor's team for capturing his opening video remarks. Now, consistent with systems theory, concerned as it is with managing for emergence, we can now claim that the launch of the hidden power of systems has happened through this event. And indeed, so advanced is Ray and Ed's narrative that the launch has already taken place in Australia tomorrow. And that brings us to our last slide, which has details of how to follow up and obtain the book. Great. Thank you very much, Gerald and Nick, and indeed all of our speakers, um, and indeed the VC, um, particularly obviously Ray and Ed. Um, but most importantly, we'd like to thank you, the audience, and the participation for your questions. Uh, we had too many to ask, so we would like um, for you to in indulge our patience and we will be trying to endeavour to answer them after the event. But as a thank you for watching, you can use that discount screen, uh, discount code on screen now to get 20% off the purchase price. And so we hope you've enjoyed the book launch, the conversation, and we hope that you're inspired to imagine new actions that you can take in your own context. And with that, I'd like to draw this book launch to a formal close. Thank you.